This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Everyone Dies, the podcast where we talk about serious illness, dying, death, and bereavement. I'm Marianne Natso, a nurse practitioner, and I'm going to use my over 40 years of nursing experience to help you understand what happens at the end of life. And I'm Charlie Navarrete, an actor in New York City, here to ask the questions that might pop into your head while you're listening. If they pop in later, send them to our website. Marianne and I believe the more you know when you are not under pressure or unconscious, the better prepared you are to make difficult decisions about your end-of-life choices. Our recipe this week will provide warmth and nourishment with every spoonful. If you have a funeral lunch to attend, you can ease the burden slow cooker style with soulful chicken soup. The trick to this recipe is to cook low and slow. (laughs) <laughs> Though low and slow can apply to other situations if, uh, ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Chicken, a few root veggies, lots of fresh herbs, salt, pepper, and chicken broth are thrown in the slow cooker before cooking away on the low setting for about six hours. When time is up, your chicken should be fall off the bone tender and ready to dice. The final touch is a hit of lemon juice. It will enliven all of the flavors as they meld together into one delicious bowlful. When you think of comfort food, this soup will be at the top of your list. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. So for this recipe and other fun facts and additional resources for this program, please go to our website and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Kindly remember to rate and review this podcast. As a licensed nonprofit organization, we are dependent on the kindness of our beloved listeners and always appreciate your donations, which are tax deductible. There you are. Please go to our webpage to donate in support of our work. www.everyonedies.org. That's every, the number one, dies.org. Marianne? So... Today I'm going to chat with y'all a little bit about water cremation. And I don't know, this might be something that you have never heard of. And if so, you're going to be so glad you're listening. Mm -hmm. What happens to the body after death is big business. Caskets cost thousands of dollars. And the land that they're um, deposited into costs more and more every year. Um, We bury every year enough caskets to measure 4 million square acres of forest. Jeez. Enough to build over 90,000 homes. The body might decompose slowly if it's embalmed, but the lacquered wood with brass and steel adornments will take generations to break down, if ever. More than half of the U.S. population chooses cremation, um, which is sold as a cleaner option. But environmentally, it's just a different kind of bad. Every year, North Americans alone use enough fossil fuels during cremation to drive halfway to the sun and back. An alternative to burial and cremation by fire is cremation by water. And it really is pretty interesting if you're a nerd, and I'm a nerd, so I thought it was really pretty interesting. Water cremation, or alkaline hydrolysis, resumation, or biocremation, these are all words that mean the same thing, is what is using water to break down the body. It produces zero emissions and uses about the same amount of water and energy that you would consume in an average two days of living. It's also gentle on the body, breaking the soft tissues and organs down first into a liquid that then becomes an amazing fertilizer and can be used to grow plants. The remaining skeleton is clean, never burned, and it's returned to the family after being pulverized into a fine white powder. From an operations perspective, if you're the person who's doing it, which you probably aren't, but just so that you know, the process 
um, including but not limited to removal, storage, and the chain of identification, is like flame-based or traditional cremation with two exceptions. One, pacemakers and other implants that cannot be exposed to extreme heat and fire do not need to be removed prior to cremation, except if it's required by law for some reason. And the second is that the remaining bone fragments need to be dried and cooled after the process. Hmm. So the process is really relatively simple. There are two pieces of equipment. The first is called the corpse dissolving resumator, which looks like an iron lung. It's about seven foot long. It's a stainless steel tank that the body is put into. It works by immersing the body in a mix of water and potassium hydroxide, which is then heated to 356 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also subjected to pressure equivalent to 10 atmospheres during the two two to three hour process. At the end of the process, the water is drained into another tank. The skeleton is removed from the resumator pulverized, and returned to the family. What's left, that water that's left, is a nutrient-rich liquid. There's no D- DNA in the liquid at all, so it's not like you know you can identify who it is. Um, some places will partner with gardens so that the water is used to water the plants. Now, it's not used on food that's eaten, in case you were wondering about that, although it could be. It's just sort of, I I guess they think that people would be a little weirded out to yeah. have wonderful juicy tomatoes that were watered <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from the byproducts of water cremation. But actually, it's the greatest fertilizer. Um, But it does give the deceased the opportunity to return to the earth and to nourish the earth. You can have a a tree planted and watered with the liquid that's left over from the process to nurture and grow your tree. Alkaline hydrolysis machines cut greenhouse emissions by a third compared to cremation and use only one-seventh the energy. Wow. You can decompose in water and become a tree for a fraction of the price of a traditional burial. So it's an economical choice as much as an ecological one. Most facilities are charging about the same as the cost of regular cremation, which can range from $700 to $3,000. And that high end, you know, has to do with um, the funeral home other stuff like we've talked about right. in yeah. our show yeah. on cremation, which, by the way, we've referenced in our show notes. In truth, there is no law that says that you have to have anything done to your body after you die. Natural burials take place without embalming and without the concrete vaults that line graves in most modern cemeteries. So if you don't want a traditional burial, and you don't want cremation by fire, and you don't want cremation by water, you can have what's called a natural burial. Um, Natural burials take place without embalming, and the bodies are wrapped in a shroud or placed in a biodegradable casket, the idea being that you will just decompose naturally. The natural burial movement started in 1998 with the opening of the all-natural cemetery called Ramsey Creek Preserve in Westminster, South Carolina. There are at least 166 natural cemeteries in the country and many more hybrid cemeteries, those that are regular cemeteries with all the, you know, fancy caskets and embalming and everything else that have sections for natural graves. The movement is driven by dissatisfaction with typical funeral rites. Most people, when they find out what happens in the embalming room, are pretty horrified. Mm. Then there's the cost. Then there's the growing concern about the environment and the effects that these procedures have on the environment and all the goods and resources devoted to the whole funeral business. And people say, you know, some people say, I don't want anything to do with that. A green variable, variable, (laughs) (laughs) 
or a green burial could be simply conducted with family input for under $1,000. But depending on the cemetery and the professional service charges, it could come to $4,000. It all depends on how you want to do it. Many natural cemeteries double as nature preserves, and many people like the idea of contributing to the ecosystem after death. And then you're actually benefiting the environment by allowing your body to rejoin that natural circle of life. Any questions about that, Charles? No, but it sounds pretty cool. The um, hmm, Which one? Water. No, I mean, the, with, the, with the water cremation. I, I, I heard of it, but I didn't know this much about it until now. Worth the price. Aren't you glad but, you woke yeah, up this morning? I um, Well, in general, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And then you got to learn about this. Yes. So you're, you know, two for two, and it's what? You know, noon. <laughs> it's going to be a good day, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, I think it would be pretty cool is if you could get, you know, like I'm a gardener, so it'd be great if like after somebody's water cremated, if you could get the water and use it in your garden, oh, you know, to grow your, garden, your flowers sure. and your yeah. roses, you know, wouldn't that be cool? And people me, say, what's your secret to that beautiful garden? And you could say, Mom. Oh, it's my mother. Yeah, it's, it's my mother. <laughs> it's my mother's touch. <laughs> Literally, my mother's touch. Yes. And I'm not making light of this, Charles. I'm honestly saying that that would be really cool because I compost here yeah. and I use and I use the um the water, you know, like I'll run water through it and collect uh-huh. that water. I call that black gold because man, you put that on your tomatoes and they go, Holy moly, what did you do? I like that. So imagine yeah. if you can get that from scrap vegetables and leaves, what they would say if they had my cremation water. You yeah, that that salad would be would be the hit of the picnic, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Something to think about. It is. It is. So what do you have for our third half, Charles? I have a poem. Oh. Who was that guy on um laughing? Oh, with Hen- the glasses. Hen- Henry No, it was Henry Gibson. Not not Artie Johnson, Henry- but Henry Gibson would would have the poems. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How did he start those? And now a poem or something like that? Um, yeah, by Henry Gibson. Um, yeah, something like that. But but he always you know mentions we his should, name. We should, pl- we should plan these things and have actual answers. Someday we will. Someday. Yeah. But prob- not today, though. But not today and probably, <laughs> probably not in the near future either. But, but someday. Someday. Because our brains are a little fragmented and things just pop in and say, oh, Somebody used to do poems. <laughs> when you said fragmented and, and you said, well, yeah, somebody used to do, I thought you were going to say pot, but that's fine. Poems and pot. Well, used to. No, pot's like legal. So I know it is. So, you know, you, you know, the people, you know what I was in, not to s- slow you down from your thing, but we, we went out to breakfast last week mm-hmm. and the waitress who's always there said I don't, she's just peppy and she's got energy and it's like geez louise like i'm looking at her running over the, she's there's one waitress in this joint oh. and she's just doing everything and talking and, blah, and i said i just want to i want to be on whatever you're on and she said well i'm not on anything but i will tell you i take two gummies before i go to bed at night and it helps me sleep i mean out loud loud voice in a restaurant and i thought man you know five five years yeah, ago yeah even just five years n- yeah. never nope not at all yeah find you know an especially an older woman just announcing yep i take two gummies before i go to bed 15 minutes you know i take them in 15 minutes i'm out it's like okay well thanks for sharing that's great I mean, anyway this stuff, poem? yeah stuff like that you know becomes <laughs> normal <laughs> yeah anyways your poem <laughs> Talk about disjointed and whatever. Yeah. So, 
This poem is titled Horatius. It is by Thomas Babington Macaulay, and as far as I know, no relation to Macaulay Culkin. Oh. Yes, I, I, I checked, and I didn't find any. Did you? Yes. Okay. So uh, the poem describes how Publius Horatius, pub to his friends, and two companions, <laughs> Spurius Lardius and Titus Erminius, better known as Spud and Hermy, hold the Sublican Bridge, the only span crossing the Tiber at Rome against the Etruscan army of Lars Persona, king of Clusium. There's going to be a quiz on this, so I hope everyone's paying attention. Now, the three heroes are willing to die to prevent the enemy from crossing the bridge and sacking the otherwise ill-defended city, while the trio close, close the front ranks of the Etruscans. Roman engineers hurriedly work to demolish the bridge, leaving their enemies on the far side of the swollen river. So, we're just going to take some of the highlights from this, and from stanza 27, did I mention that this is a really long-ass poem? Stanza 27. <laughs> then out spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth, death cometh soon or late. And how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? A few stanzas later, stanza 29. Fall down the bridge, Sir Consul, with all the speed ye may. I, with two more to help me, will hold the foe and play. In yon straight path a thousand may well be stopped by three. Now who will stand on either hand and keep the bridge with me? Now, in the next thrilling stanza, as the span of the bridge becomes unstable, Horatius urges Laredus and Hermanius to retreat while he fights on alone. What a guy. His companions yeah. regain the Roman side before the bridge begins to collapse, but Horatius can no longer cross to safety and therefore leaps into the river, still fully armed. And you know how heavy armor is. Macaulay continues on stanza 50. No sound of joy or sorrow was heard from either bank, but friends and foes in dumb surprise with parted lips and staring eyes stood gazing where he sank. And when above the surges they saw his crest appear, all Rome sent forth a rapturous cry, and even the rags of Tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer. So he reaches the Roman shore, richly rewarded, and gains mythic statics by his act of bravery. In the closing stanza, stanza 70, with weeping and with laughter, still is the story told how well Horatius kept the bridge in the brave days of old. So as Marianne said earlier, this poem is about holding firm to your convictions and not yielding to others. It is about leadership, but it's also about staying strong in the face of adversity. And with that thought in mind, please stay tuned for the continuing saga of Everyone Dies. And thank you for listening. Like sand through an hourglass, so are the days of our lives. And the nights. This is Charlie Navarrete, <laughs> who remembers the insights of comedian Rita Rudner. My grandmother was a very tough woman. She buried three husbands, and two of them were just napping. <laughs> And I'm Marianne Matzo, and we're going to see you next week, we hope. Remember that everyone dies, and that every day is a gift. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion, are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. 
Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.